So who has had any times when your phone has run at the wrong time? Or the wrong place, right? You've had that happen, or maybe even uh, a little different, the, uh, the phone rings at home, and you say, I don't really want to answer it, I shouldn't answer it, I'm not going to answer it, all right, I'll go ahead and answer it. And then sure enough, it's some sales marketing person, and you say, I knew I shouldn't have answered that, right? Those calls come at different times. It's a great story today about God's call to David. It's, it's a, a story that we don't get into very much. Oftentimes there's other stories about David, but not the call story. But before we hop too deep into the text today, let me, let me bring you back into some of the broader, bigger picture. So Samuel had been this person called by God earlier. And Samuel was a God-fearing man with great strength and great discipline and devotion. And Samuel ends up uh, being asked by God because of the people crying out, saying, we want a king. Everybody else has a king. We want a king. God, to this point, had said to the people, Israel, I'll be your king. But God relents, actually, to the people and says, fine, if you want a king, I'll give you a king. But just so you know, you're not going to really like him and it's not going to work out so well for you. But people still say, give us a king. And the name you need to know is that Saul becomes the first king. But Saul is not a good king. Now, there's lots that he does that follows God. And lots that he does that's honorable. But there's one particular time at the end where he's given some direct words saying to this people, I want you to go to them and, um, and destroy all of these people and leave no people and no animals. And he doesn't. And God looks down upon him for that. And because of that, Saul is no longer going to be the king. Forty-two years, Saul actually had been the king. But now David is chosen to be the king. And he's chosen in the language within the scripture says, and God has chosen, he says, for myself. It was almost like Saul was appointed because the people wanted a king, and now God's saying, I'm going to appoint somebody who I know is going to follow through them. I'm appointing for myself a king to be with you. And David becomes a really a well-respected king, a beloved king. He unites the nations together. He's, he builds an empire. Jerusalem becomes the, the center and really a, a thriving community again. David goes on to write, be a prolific writer of the Psalms. If you open up the Psalms 150, a little over half of those are written by David. You can see in the beginning, you say a psalm of David or from David. He becomes this prolific writer. He's also not perfect. And we come to that at the end of our lesson. He's, he's a good king, but he's not perfect. So within this story, within the story, there are some really good places to, to kind of hang our hats for a while. <coughs> the first is this. God calls for trust. Samuel is given the responsibility, saying, I want you to have a, there's going to be a new king. And it's actually, Samuel laments this. Samuel liked Saul. He didn't want to see Saul taken out, and we find a greed. And the language here is that God says to Samuel, when are you going to get beyond your greed? When are you going to move forward with what I've already been working on? And in the midst of that, Samuel has to trust that God is still working out God's plan. He's got to trust even more because he's sent to a people, knowing that as he walks into this people, they're going to probably not receive him, and it might well be that Saul is going to start looking to kill him. Saul had been somebody who, later we're going to find out, kills his own brother has some of his own leaders killed. And so, in some ways, Samuel is fearful about what's being expected. It's also a little bit trusting when he says, look, all I want you to do is go into this sanctuary, and as people gather together for worship, you find the family of Jesse, and I'll let you know who's going to be king. If you were Samuel, why don't you be walking in going, just a few more details. Right, Jesse? 
But Samuel's called to trust God. I will show you who you should choose. We're called to be people who trust ourselves today as well. That we trust promises of God, saying, I will be with you. You are for you. You are called. Heaven is a place for you. There's trust for us. That in the very work of Jesus Christ, our salvation has been secured. It is for us. Trust that times when we sense God calling us, in, maybe it's understanding the waters of our own baptisms or with the scripture or in conversations with others, that we hear some sense about God stirring us. And that we're called to include people who trust as well. Trust wasn't just for those biblical times. It's a big part for us today as well. There's another place that really stands out, and it's that God's working is oftentimes simply preparing us for the future. David gets anointed today. We're not sure exactly how old it is. Some people say he's about 12. Some say maybe he's later teens. Let's just put it in the middle and say he's 15 years old. Here's what you need to know. It's not until 15 years later that David actually becomes king. He gets anointed in this, shh, this private ceremony. It's just Jesse and his brothers, and they do this special anointing and prayers, and David and the family know. But there's nothing public. For 15 years, think about how many times David is trying to say, God, what are you doing, and what else am I supposed to do? But there's a beautiful sense about that God in our lives does preparing work. Not just for a David, but there are events and situations in our own lives. Tragedies or difficulties or accomplishments that God likely has used to prepare you maybe for life and faith right now today. I hope you can hear that. It might well be that God has done some things in your past that have been done to prepare you to get ready for your life and your faith today. It can also be that God might well be about using today, about stirring and moving and preparing you for something that is yet maybe years Away. There's a beautiful picture of God today in this. It's also surprising, God. How many of you are uh, the youngest in your family? You youngest are probably liking this journey through the Old Testament, right? Time and time again, what we find is that the youngest is the one who's lifted up. It was Moses, it's Jacob, and we see it again in, in Joseph, and now again today. It's the youngest who gets lifted up. How many of you are the oldest going, oh, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just get back to going, yeah, that's me. I want something. But there's something grand about God stirring things up. The expected is that the older who would be the wisest and most responsible is the one who would, who would, if you will, gain the responsibility and the calling. But that's not the case. God keeps doing something new. And God's going to keep, throughout Scripture, doing things that are new. Pulling people who are unexpected into life. David, imagine David, he's out watching the sheep. His family doesn't even think enough of him. Jesse is told, bring all of your sons. So he brings seven of them. David's out watching the sheep. He either just doesn't count enough, or he's too young. And his family, if that's the case, that they just kind of disown David a little bit, that's almost a picture that we get from Scripture. What is it like for David then to live into something that's called and planted on, on that very day? There's something great about God's stirring. Not just, not just in the New Testament, but in these great Old Testament stories. But here's the center of this story. And it's really in the center of what was read. There's the line that God 
God looks on the heart. And the gift in that is that God doesn't see as we see. But God sees with different, with clearer, with penetrating eyes for us. They look with outward appearances, but the Lord looks on the heart. That's what it says. We know some of those lines, right? Beauty is only skin deep. Or looks aren't everything. Or looks can be deceiving. Or, you can't judge a book by it. You know these. And sometimes we live into this. But God looks on the heart. Sometimes when we look upon us, we can make some quick judgments by what they look like, or what they say, by what they wear, or what they do. And we can be rather quick to look on people's surface and not really what's deeper inside of a heart. We have to be cautious about their effectiveness that God has in store for the kingdom of God. It's not just sometimes how we look upon others, though. It's sometimes how we look upon ourselves. Sometimes we're the ones who look upon ourselves with eyes that aren't like God's. And we're the ones who limit who we are and who God wants us to be. Who we think we could even be. And you might well have God trying to keep shaking his head and say, no, there's so much more in you. There's so much more. God looks on the heart. And that's good news. It's sometimes penetrating news that God knows us. If you fast forward the story about David's call, those 15 years when he's living into being a king, he's not perfect. And the one story that stands out is the story for which this psalm is penned later by David. The story is this. David looks out one day and he sees bare, naked, bathing, sunbathing Bathsheba. And he says, bring her up to me. They end up having sexual relations and she gets pregnant. She's married to Uriah. David sends for Uriah, who's a leader in battle. And brings Uriah back and says, Uriah, you've been doing such a good job. Why don't you take some time at home? You know, wink, wink. David at night looks out and he sees Uriah sleeping out on the patio, on the stone. Goes from the next day and says, David, or Uriah, you've been doing so good. Go enjoy some time with your wife. You deserve it. The next night he still sleeps out on the patio of the stone. He sent back to battle the next day with a little note that Uriah is supposed to give to the commander. It says this, when you arrive, when you go into battle, make sure Uriah is the first one, and as soon as you get 30 yards out, uh, everybody back kind of just let Uriah go forward. We don't know if that's really what the note said, but it was close. Uriah gets killed. David, oh bless his heart, here's a woman who's pregnant, I'll go ahead and marry her. Kind, good soul David, right? But there's a little prophet who comes and says, David, I know what you've done. I know who you are. I know your heart. It's out of that story that David, an imperfect leader, an imperfect king, pens these words that we sing today. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and put a new and a right spirit within me. David knows, one, he needs a new heart. That before God, there's always a sense that we need something new. It's also that David knows that there's nobody else who's going to be able to give him a clean heart except for God. And so what we find is a deep, contrite David. 
And we know that because what, part of what we see is his life after this, is that he becomes an even stronger, bitter king. Put a new and a right spirit in him. God knows our heart. Or maybe what's even better is that we know God's heart. We see God's heart revealed in stories like this where he keeps calling imperfect people to say, come and follow me. We know God's heart when we see him walking with the nation time after time, drawing it together. We know God's heart ultimately when we see Jesus Christ given to us. As a little child, the surprise coming in the youngest becomes the gift for us. Philippians 2 reads this way. <clears throat> it invites us then into our own hearts. Have this attitude among yourselves which was in Christ Jesus. Who although he was in the form of God did not regard equality with God something to be grasped but emptied himself. He humbled himself. Became, obe became obedient to the point of death and even death on the cross. We know the heart of God in part because we see the heart of Jesus Christ. But we also know this, that God looks and doesn't want nice faces on us. Doesn't want just good clothing and something of good outward appearance, but longs for our hearts to be good too. One pastor this great world, this simple one. There's no substitute for a God-pleasing heart. A heart that desires to serve. A heart that's willing to trust. A heart that is ready to be reasoned. A heart that's dedicated to God. May that kind of heart be fashioned inside of us. May it be formed to be our heart. May it be found within us. Amen.